This podcast is brought to you by the upcoming Bioceuticals Seminar Series, The New Science of Detoxification with Dr Chris Shade. Dr Shade is a globally recognised expert on toxic burden and targeted liposomal delivery systems. He has lectured and trained doctors in the US and internationally on the subject of mercury, heavy metals and the human detoxification system. In this one-day workshop, Dr. Shade will share his deep understanding on how to restore, manage and augment all three phases of detoxification with profound implications for health. At the end of the day, you will have a full understanding of how to provide a personalised, holistic detoxification program that moves away from the hit-and-miss shotgun approach practitioners may have used in the past. For more information visit bioceuticals.com.au slash education slash events. This is FX Medicine and I'm Andrew whitfield Cook. And with me on the line today is Greg Mapp, who's an Australian-trained and accredited pharmacist with extensive practical experience in integrative medicine. Greg graduated with diplomas in clinical nutrition and herbal medicines from the University of New England, and he now lectures in complementary medicine, pharmacy practice, and pharmacotherapeutics at Griffith University School of Practice. And today we're welcoming Greg back in a second, the second part of a two-part series on drug detoxification. So welcome back, Greg. Thanks, Andrew. Greg, in our last podcast, um, you took us through your beginnings and the development of the drug detox centre, Mirakai, uh, at Burley Heads on the Gold Coast, um, which was, you know, in your words, a very hard-earned but very rewarding um, breakthrough approach. Absolutely, yes. And in the last podcast, we spoke about your involvement with illicit drug detox and helping patients achieve that detox using natural means as both an adjunct and even an alternative in some cases. But today what I want to do is go through the detox processes that you engage when people need to come off prescription medicines. It's a little bit of a different sort of slant on things. Yes, it, it is. But I guess, you know, as, as you and I both say, really, that drug is, drug is a drug. And uh, whether it's illicit or, or legal, it really makes no difference. You can certainly abuse both. And unfortunately, there's far more people abusing um, legal drugs than there is than there's illicit drugs. It's a, it's a much bigger problem. M- many more people die from legal drug overdose than they do from illegal drugs, that's for sure. With the, obviously alcohol and, and, and tobacco at the top and then legal drugs coming down from that. So when we're talking about prescription drugs, what's the size yeah. of the problem that we're looking at here? Well, it's huge, and I think that um, the main problem with prescription drugs is people aren't taking personal responsibility for their own drug take. So they go along to the GP, they get a drug, and they don't ask questions. And as you know, some drugs are physically addictive, and, and if you get enough of them, or well, your body becomes addicted to them. And, you know, people on benzodiazepines and antidepressants and opioids from, from prescriptions is, is just massive. Yeah. I just read a statistic the other day that says you've got more chance of dying from an overdose than you're having of dying in a car crash, for instance. You know, there's a lot more people wow. having problems with drugs than there are with uh, many other things in life. So, yeah, it's a big problem. Yeah. Um, what are the major groups of drugs which patients present for detox? Where, where does the issue lie? Well, I think the two top ones would be the benzodiazepines and the opioids. Um, the opioids being a particular problem because you can buy them over the counter. Mm. So they don't even have to go to the doctor for those. You know, lots and lots of people are addicted to things that have got codeine in them, for instance, uh, particularly codeine combined with, say, an antihistamine and a painkiller like paracetamol. People are chewing on those all day long and, and, and getting the buzz out of both the antihistamine and the, and the codeine. Mm. Um, benzodiazepines, well, they're, they're something that I think... I often say benzodiazepines have become a recreational drug. You know, there's so many people on benzodiazepines that uh, don't really need to be on them. Yeah. And they're on them for a long time. And, you know, there's two two basic types. There's a tranquilizing type you take through the day and then there's a, a hypnotic type you take as a sleeping tablet at night. 
and there's so many people on either one or both of those. It's incredible. And then, of course, you have the antidepressants, which are a whole... Oh, look, they're, 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 they're a mixed bag of things. It's a very difficult situation with antidepressants. Many, many people are prescribed wrongly with antidepressants, and there's a lot of people on them that shouldn't be. And those three areas are the ones that are... They're all physically addicted drugs. Yeah. So, so I think they're the three main ones that I see as, as problems. You know, when you... I, I, I think it's interesting the points you make about benzodiazepines. I remember an ad years ago with a, a very famous now deceased um, female actress or actor, Australian mm. actor called Ruth Cracknell. Do you remember the ad? Oh, give, yes. give your feelings yes. a no, go. No. And people will remember her from Mother and Son, a very famous comedy show. That's right. She's actually yeah, um, yeah. very serious about, you know, giving your feelings a go, you know, that, that feeling sad doesn't mean you're depressed necessarily. Yeah. And, you know, benzodiazepines, what they do is they, they lower your feelings up or down, you know. You end up becoming just becoming like a straight line. Yeah. And after a while, you can't really relate to ups and downs and until something big happens and then you really crash. Yeah. So benzodiazepines are sort of uh, making people go more towards depression if you continuously take them. Mm. Uh, what's interesting to me is back in my day of nursing, um, they were referred to as a benzodiazepine receptor. We were actually deficient right. in benzodiazepines, not a GABA receptor. Oh, really? <laughs> it was a okay. benzodiazepine receptor. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, we know now that it's all to do with GABA, don't we? Yeah. Mm, that's right. So the the issue with opioids is huge, and one mm. of the issues that that I think pharmacists have got an ethical issue to address these is because not only are they addictive, but people are actually getting rebound pain from overuse of opioids. Yeah, well, that's possible, and it happens with all sorts of painkillers. But uh, the problem with opioids really is, I, I think, more is the tolerance that you get with opioids. Yeah. So, you know, the two things about physical addiction are tolerance and withdrawal or physical withdrawal. You get those two things if, if your drug's physically addictive, although there's lots of grey areas, of course. Yeah. So opioids are the classic example. If you take a certain dose of opioids now, in a month's time, you might need more to give you the same pain mm. effect. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and therefore, people are becoming more and more uh, addicted by increasing the dosages as they go along with pain. Um Interestingly, the only thing that doesn't become tolerant is your eye, is your pupil of your eye. Um, ah. It becomes pinpoint. Yeah. 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 So that's always um, diagnostic, it, if you like. It, yeah, it always stays pinpoint. It never, it never gets tolerant, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, and once people get addicted to the opioids, their whole body becomes a problem. They've got GI problems. We basically talked about this in the last podcast with heroin, so it's really the same sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but when we're talking about um, uh, sort of uh, uh, sorry, legal drugs, it comes down to the point where pharmacists have to be really careful about when they're selling over-the-counter narcotics as well and become a bit more uh, professional in that, in that area, yeah. which I'm sure they are, but it's just something that they need to be aware of. Absolutely. And there's systems now in place. That, I think there was a call to... Um, to return all opioids into the S4 category. That's the the doctor only, the prescription only category. Is that right? Yeah, there is at the moment. That's, they're talking about that. That that may not work. I think it may be a bit too much. No, but, yeah. Um, I'm thinking yeah. migraine the sufferers, about, migraineurs, yeah. Yeah, the thing about codeine is it's a, it's a funny drug rule. I don't know what's funny is the right word, but at the low dose that you buy over the counter, it virtually has no pain-killing effect really at all much. You know, you need to get at least 30 milligrams to get a decent pain-killing effect. So ostensibly taking a, a dose of penadine or, you know, I shouldn't mention brand names, I guess, but small doses of, of codeine will give you no effect. Yeah. So we're looking like above but, the, well, above 12 and probably the 15 milligrams, two tablets. Yeah, so you need that amount to, to start getting a decent effect. Yeah. And uh, people are sort of getting ad addicted to things that, that it's not even really helping them as well. And when you're talking oh. about the other effects, there's also the the issue of constipation and, and um, absolutely um, yeah yeah the gastrointestinal effects are horrific mm. yeah so tell me how you address that or I, I guess first what do you see how do you, how do these patients present to you to say I have a problem I need to come off these drugs well I think if we look at it, uh, particular drugs as we go along, I mean, I think we've pretty well covered the opioids as far as what to do as, as far as withdrawing them from it in the last podcast. Yeah. Um, 
So I don't see a lot of people who come to me with, with opioid addiction and say I want to get off them because they've got basically chronic pain and it's it's something that they need to address the pain before they can get off the opioids. Yep. I don't find a lot of people who want to come off those. I find more people who want to come off the benzodiazepines and the uh, antidepressants. So benzodiazepines in particular, say someone is taking a sleeping tablet every night and they come to me and say, listen, I'm sick of doing this. What can we do about it? Yep. Um, that's one certain big group of people. And the other group of people with the antidepressants is they're having certain side effects that they don't like um, and they want to come off the antidepressant. So they're two big groups that I see quite regularly. So let's let's delve into each group then, I think we need to. So mm. with the benzos, um, yep. which they are commonly called. <laughs> mm, yes, that's true. <laughs> tell, me, tell me what you do. Tell me what happens and, and what... what um, interventions do you use to help people get off benzos? Well, the benzodiazepines, as I said, we're looking at two areas, really. They're using them either as a tranquilizer through the day or they're using them as a hypnotic at night. So if we look at the hypnotic area first, um, the hypnotic effect of benzodiazepines really does reduce your REM sleep, which, which is REM sleep, which you know is a good part of your sleep, the dreaming part. If you continuously take these benzodiazepines, well, your REM sleep is shortened, and eventually you almost become what we like to say sleep starved. Really, well. you're almost like you're unconscious going to bed, getting up and going back to bed unconscious without really getting a decent REM sleep. So this can lead to depression, and you end up having two drugs. But going back to the benzos, the thing about them is if you stop taking them, you're going to get the uh, withdrawal symptom of not being able to sleep. Yeah, and this is a classic situation where people say, "Oh, if I don't take my sleeping tablet, I can't sleep. Therefore, yeah. I must need it." So, first of all, we need to counsel people that that's what's going to happen. It's going to be difficult for you to sleep if you're taking if you're going to stop taking your benzos. Yeah. Now, benzos also come in all different half lives. So, the shorter half life benzos are the ones that are harder to get off. In fact, so, so so much so that the alprazolam, which is one of the shortest ones, is actually now um, classified as a narcotic. You, you've got to treat it as a narcotic. Yeah. So many people are addicted to it. So the best one to come off is actually Valium because it's got a longer half-life. That's a bit easier to come off. So sometimes we transfer people from short half life to long half-life Valium to, before we start bringing them down. Um, of course, this has all got to be through the doctor as well. Yeah. But with benzos, most doctors want people to come off them. So it's not a big issue in most cases. Um, but generally speaking, if we've got a hypnotic benzo, we're going to tell people that they're not going to sleep once they stop taking them or it's going to be more difficult. And because they work on the GABA receptor um, and they make GABA work better, if you like, by sitting on the receptor, mm. we can use a herb which would also sit on the GABA receptor, which, of course, is valerian. So my favourite herb to use with uh, trying to get people off benzos is to give them valerian. And we know valerian takes a little while to get into the system to work to, you know, as, as best it can. So you need to sort of uh, slowly decrease your benzo and at the same time take your valerian. And at some stage that will cross over, usually in about a seven-day period, and hopefully the, the valerian will will stop the uh, withdrawal symptoms of the benzos, what? which will be lack of sleep in the hypnotic case. Can I, just, can I just ask a quick question about valerian? Mm. There's a lot of practitioners yep. out there that are, that are reticent about using valerian because they say it, it um, causes vivid dreams and, uh, um, and, yes, and upsets it does. sleep. and so, so does benzos, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I don't think there's much choice. I mean, you could use carver. Mm. Um, but as we said in the last podcast, there is some abuse uh, surrounding carb, or even though it's not a physically addictive drug, we've decided now. Yeah. Um, but there is an abuse factor with carb. And I, I haven't had a lot of trouble with people abusing carb when I've prescribed it. But traditionally, I've used valerian. Yeah. And yes, there is there is a possibility of vivid dreams, but unfortunately, it's the same thing with uh, with benzos anyway. Yeah. How big is the issue with the, you know, the vivid dreams? Are we talking 10%, 50%? Look, I don't think it's that huge, to be honest. I, I, I don't see it that very often. 
So I'm happy to use it. I don't think that's a real problem with it at all. Gotcha. And uh, if it's going to get people off a of benzo, well, it's that's much better. We'll work through because it, Because yeah. interestingly enough, it, it's, it works on a different uh, receptor. The GABA receptor is made up of, of subsets, and um, the valerian works on a different subset receptor to compare to the benzo, and it's not as addictive, or it's not addictive at all. Yeah. It's not physically addictive. Yeah. And another good thing about the, the valerian is it doesn't give you this hangover in the morning or, or effect in the morning that benzos do, particularly the longer-acting benzos that, that can cause people to fall over, particularly in the elderly. You know, if you take their benzo at night, yeah. something like uh, Mogadon or something that's long-acting, the next morning it'll last 12 hours and they might fall over when they get out of bed and, and break a hip or whatever. Yeah. So we need to get them off those benzos, particularly the long-acting ones. And what about valerian's not a bad thing to do? What about the other? Call it a side effect of taking valerian, yeah. which is the inevitable screwed up face <laughs> from the taste. <laughs> well, the taste. Yeah. Well, I use tablets. <laughs> yeah. I don't use liquid. That's for sure. Uh, believe but, it or not, some people like liquid. But, well, uh, you know what I've found though is that if you get well prepared, good fresh valerian, yes, there's mm. still that reminiscence of old bed sock <laughs> in the background. Yes. But it, you, you can, yeah, but you can smell there's a fragrance to it, the, the, like there's a freshness to it, whereas if you get old valerian, it's just old bed socks. Well, that's true. So that's you true. get good yeah. valerian. It, it, it's not so bad. No, no, and pe- some people enjoy it. Some people take it. Well, I don't say enjoy, but they, they tolerate it yeah. quite well. Yeah. But, you know, the, the side effects of the benzos, you know, things like memory impairment, depression, um, elderly people falling over, you know, dependence, all those types of things. Well, valerian is certainly a, a much better option for them than, than taking the benzos. And naturally, people who want to get off everything will hopefully then go off the valerian eventually. Yeah. But it, it can be just a short-term thing to, to get them off the benzo. Do you use any other herbs in combination with valerian or do you just use, just use straight valerian? I usually just use valerian. Sometimes I use a bit of passion flower. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't mind using that as well, and, and um, sometimes I use carver as well. But I think valerian is the mainstay as far as benzos withdrawal. You know, it's been used in the past, and there's quite a few little clinical studies to say that it works. So I, I tend to stick to that. Yeah. Any if I need to, I'll use something else. Any nutrients? Any magnesium or anything like that? Oh well, of course. You know, if you're going to treat anyone for any sort of anxiety or sleep problems, you have to. They're going to be uh, healthy to start with. So I guess it goes back to the old adage that we need to talk about exercise and diet as well, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, Magnesium is quite interesting to use as well. Yes, you're right. Uh, I must admit I hadn't thought of telling you about that. But, yes, magnesium we can use because a lot of people are deficient in magnesium and it does help with sleep. So and you certainly mean- we could use that. And you mentioned some, a very important point there, something that um, Felice Jacker has done a lot of work on, and that's the diet and its mm. direct correlation with depression and, and things like that. That It's not just yes. – it, it's really showing a causal effect, not just um, an after effect, as in yeah, poor I, diet causes I think, depression. Yeah. I think uh, that's really interesting, and I think it's a more – you know, we were sort of talking about benzos and anxiety first. If we're going to talk about depression, that's a whole new ball game. I guess, I guess they're sort of they're sort of linked in a way, but, but uh, depression has got much more. It seems to have much more effect from diet, e.g., for instance, uh, uh, inflammation of the body yeah. is directly affecting depression. But I don't know whether it's ever been proven about inflammation and anxiety. But no. certainly, magnesium may be helpful with anxiety. There's no doubt about that. Mm. And, of course, we can't take a lot of notice of serum magnesium because we know that it's an intracellular ion, so we go on symptoms. Yep. And and often it's hard to tell practitioner or doctors, or doctors this because they look at their serum magnesium and they say, everything's fine, don't worry about it. But we know that, you know, you have to go on symptoms with magnesium. Yeah, it's a nonsense. Unless you're going to do an intracellular test. Yep. So red blood cell so, magnesium? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so yeah, um, apologies there. Certainly, you could you'd give them magnesium if you, if you wanted to say three hundred milligram elemental, three to six hundred milligram elemental, 
daily may help with their anxiety and their sleeping. Yep. And what else do you use? Um, I know we've skipped back and forward a little bit here with um, depression. Yeah. But going back to the benzos and anxiety, um, yes. w- what about um, you know CBD, mindfulness, exercise, yoga, that sort of intervention? Of course. Yes, of course. And uh, I, I guess I, I went straight to supplements because that's what we're sort of uh, talking about. But naturally, we, we look at the whole person and, and, and certainly use cognitive therapy if we can. Um, I think psychologists are very underused in Australia at the moment. Um, yes, we definitely would, would refer them to psychologists if, if we can. If somebody's going to see their doctor to come off a benzo, can the yep. doctor access that, um, you know, six visits to a psychologist to help? Yes. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that yes. thing's available for those patients. Idea. Yeah, I think it's brilliant. Absolutely, yeah. It, it's it's, yeah. it's unfortunately underused, but yes, it's it's available. And I think it's a great idea. And the people that I've recommended that to have had come come back to me with really great results. They, they've really appreciated the, the psychology tip visits, and it's worked well when you when you add that to, you know, a bit of uh, herbal supplement and also a lot of support. Yeah, you need a lot of support, and the person has got to be really content to give it a go. You know, this is one of the main things with the all drug detoxification, of course. So I'd urge, yeah, be I, ready for it. I'd, I'd urge all of our listeners to to access that by you know um, dialoguing with their the patient's GP so that they can access this mm. you know really important Absolutely. support. Absolutely, mechanism. yeah. Because anxiety is something that can be used, can can be treated with cognitive therapy. There's no doubt about it. Mm. And unfortunately, too many people are on these benzos because, as as I've already said, they lead, they can lead to, to depression. They can lead to memory impairment and all sorts of things that accidents, car accidents, all types of problems in society that are sort of things that we don't look at. We look at alcohol doing all those things, but there's so many people out there on benzos giving the same problems. One thing I did want to say about benzos was benzos are very, uh, in, a, in a strange way, benzos are safe as far as overdose goes. They're very difficult to overdose on a benzo, even though a lot of people, when I say safe, they don't kill you. Yeah. A lot of people overdose on benzos and go to hospital and come back out. But where they're very dangerous is when they're um, combined with alcohol because you get this potentiation effect. And a small amount of benzos and a small amount of alcohol ends up being a large effect. It's called potentiation because of the effects on the liver and things like that that stops the uh, metabolism. And so alcohol and benzos are a dangerous combination, and a lot of people are getting into that, like children, like kids, yeah. going out having a valium while they're having a drink, etc. So wow, something that's something that's quite dangerous is just the crazy. Of, yeah, alcohol and, and benzos. And what about suppression of the breathing breathing center in the brain? Yes, well, that's what happens. But benzos on their own are, are difficult to die from. You know, you can take a whole packet of benzos and it probably wouldn't kill you if you're a normal, healthy person. Gosh. If you add alcohol to that, you can certainly die from it. Wow. So we need to be aware of that. And now with that depressing thought, let's move on to how people can get off their antidepressants. Okay. (laughs) Now, now there's so many different sorts. Well, when I say so many different sorts, what is there, three or four classes? SS? At least, yeah, there's more actually, but yeah. Uh, Okay, so you've got the SSRIs. Yes. The serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. You've got your yes. newer SNRIs, your serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors. And you've got your yes. older class, the tricyclics, but there's others as well. Right. So are they treated very differently? Well, the, the first the first thing that came, that came out with the tricyclics, the tricyclics had the effect of being an antidepressant but also being a CNS depressant. So in other words... If you took a tricycle, you get drowsy. And it had lots of side effects. Uh, strangely enough, one, one of the listed side effects of tricyclics is instant death. I always love that side effect. I Cheapest. think it's fantastic. Via <laughs> 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 an uh, hard arrhythmia. But it's actually listed as a side effect. Um, and, you know, it, it, then people were taking these, these tricyclics and getting very drowsy. Then came out the first uh, SSRI, which was Prozac, I believe, was the first mm. one, and it's a stimulant. So all of a sudden, people are taking these these antidepressants, and they're getting wow, I'm awake, I'm I'm running around, I'm having fun, I'm I'm waking up instead of getting drowsy. Yeah. So 
the SSRIs became very, very popular over the tricyclics because one of the that was one of the reasons. But the other reason it does have a slightly uh, less side effect profile than the tricyclics, so that they are safer, particularly in overdose. Um, then the NS, SNRIs came out. They have a slightly better effect as an antidepressant as a class. Mm-hmm. But interestingly enough, if you look at the tricyclics, the SSRIs and the SNRIs overall, there's very little difference with actual efficiency or efficacy between any three. But I think because of the side effect profiles, they've become, certainly the tricyclics have become not, not so useful anymore. Ah, see, I thought there was a slight swing back to the tricyclics. Well, saying that, there is. <laughs> but, uh, but as an overall effect, there's certainly no not difference. Used anywhere near as much. Right. They're, 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 not, they're not used anywhere near as much at this stage. Yeah. But there is a slight swing back towards them, yes, there is. Because they do, they're not, they're not quite sure how they work, but they do believe that they do uh, selectively inhibit noradrenaline reuptake as well. So they're almost like an SNRI, the tricyclists that are starting to decide. Uh, in the old days, we didn't really know how they worked. We, we knew they had something to do with serotonin, but um, the whole serotonin theory is almost going out the window now. It's, it's, it's certainly a, it's a difficult situation talking about antidepressants at the moment because a lot of people are on them that shouldn't be, and there's a lot of theories floating around about which ones are best and, and are any of them any good. <laughs> so wow. It's an interesting situation. Um, one of the things about antidepressants is that they don't really work that well for minor depression or even moderate depression above uh, placebo. Yeah. They work very well for, for major depression for, for some people, but minor and moderate depression, which a lot of people have been prescribed these drugs for, um, there's not a lot of evidence to say they're going to do any good. Wow. And what about another class, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which you know traditionally they were linked with the, the tyramine issues? Yes, that's right. When when you had the old type, like the alpanate, mm. uh, if you had a lot of tyramine in your food, like fermented cheese or uh, uh, Vegemite was a big one, yeah. <laughs> well, you've got this hypertensive crisis. Yeah. But um, now with the newer ones, the meclobamide, you know, it actually only works on a, a particular receptor that, that is not affected by tyramine. Right. So it's safe. So the newer ones are okay, but they're not used very often. I think that's possibly uh, wrong. I think they should be because they haven't got so much of the sexual dysfunction side effect as the SSRIs and the SNRIs, which I find is one of the main, one of the main reasons why people want to get off them. And what about things like you know um, side effects like dry mouth and flattened effect? Do they do they occur across all of those classes? Well, they're more they're more in the tricyclics. Um, you certainly can get them with the others, but the tricyclics are the ones that cause more of those, um, if you like, uh, atropine-like effects, yep. the dry mouth, the blurred vision, the constipation, urinary retention, that type of thing, uh, and the drowsiness. But the main problem with those tricyclics is the cardiotoxic effects, the arrhythmias, and perhaps even hypertension. Um, so that's why a lot of people... We're now using SSRIs or SNRIs yeah. because of the lower chance of major side effects. With the SSRIs and SNRIs, the main side effect is insomnia and nausea. They're the two things that I find the most difficult. And a lot of people take these uh, SSRIs at night when they should be taking in the morning because they're giving them insomnia. Ah, they're, they're, uh-huh. yes. Yeah, they're... So that's that's a problem that I find a lot of people do with, with SSRI. But um, obviously what we're trying to do is get people off them, not just say when's the best time to take them. Let's say somebody was appropriately prescribed one of the SSRIs or SNRIs. Yes. Um, can it be as simple as, listen, stop taking it at night, take it in the morning and you get, you're get you on your way? Um, well, you certainly you can certainly get over the insomnia. Yeah. That's a possibility. Yeah, as long um, as they the other thing. The other thing about SSRIs is, and SNRIs is, some people just seem to be, uh, they, they don't seem to work for them. There's not, they're, they're, uh, I, I just can't think of the words now that I'm trying to think of, but the, the patient, it doesn't work for the patient in particular cases. And the non responders, that's yeah. the words I was trying to think of. <clears throat> and that's, and a, that's um, a high yeah. amount, though, too, isn't it? Like, I, I've heard it that is. it's as high as 50%. So you're a hit and miss. Yeah. Yeah. That's right, yeah. I, I, you know, like, there's some literature saying about 35% of people will get a benefit. 
even wow. play your depression. So, you know, some some places are saying this and some are not. But uh, what we usually do is look at their folic acid or folinic acid. Um, and if we give them some of that, sometimes they become responders. Yep. That's one of the reasons why they're non-responders is their folinic acid. They're not being able to convert folic acid to folinic acid. Right. So we can give them folinic acid and try that if they're a non-responder. Um, we can also add something like SAMI if they're a non-responder because we can give SAMI without the fear of serotonin syndrome. Right. So if we want to keep the person on the antidepressant, and they're, they're, we, we've talked to their doctor, they said, look, they need this drug, there's a necessity for it to have it, to continue, but we want to find the best way for them to continue it. And uh, certainly if they're a non-responder, folinic acid is interesting. And you can sometimes think out the square, like the other side of the square. Like I had a lady come in not so long ago, and I, and I suspected that she had uh, sleep apnea. Mm. And we did a test because we we do our own test for sleep apnea, and we found she was uh, having apnea forty seven times an hour, and she was sleeping. God, so she was just not sleeping. It was just incredible. The first day we put her on the CPAP machine, the first night, she felt better. The next day. I rang her two days later and I said, how are you feeling? And she said, I've been up at 6 o'clock in the morning washing the floors. I've never been able to get out of bed before 10 o'clock. Gosh. So something like this, you can think outside the square and cause people to turn their, their, their whole life around rather than just taking a tablet. Yeah. She, she's on uh, benzos at nights and, and perhaps a teen for the day and we've got her off the benzos now and she's certainly looking towards going off to paroxetine next. So. Gosh. You know, um, something heard, like that can be the reason. I've heard also that zinc added to um, even resistant depression, major depression, um, can help the SSRI to work. Is that right? Um, look, I'm not too sure about that, to be perfectly honest. Um, I know that uh, methylation is important. Mm. So if we look at the B vitamins, you know, we can certainly add B vitamins. And I think it's important also to think about uh, inflammation. We can certainly give people fish oil yep. um, and uh, curcumin. And, that's a really uh, interesting area of research, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> and also also probiotics, of course, yep. uh, to, to reduce uh, systemic inflammation. So if we're going to tell someone, if, if someone's decided they're going to go off their antidepressant, I mean, we've been talking about helping people while they're on the antidepressant to make sure it works. Yep. That's one thing. If we're going to take people off their antidepressant and we've got full go-ahead from the doctor, they want them off it, which is not that common. I mean, people, do, most doctors just say, oh, no, if it's not broke, don't fix it, you know. Mm. But most people say, hang on, I'm, I'm not having any sexual desire. I feel terrible. I've got nausea and I've got insomnia. The doctor says, but I've got to keep on my tablet. <laughs> so we, we need to talk to the doctor about that and see what we can do. If they say, yes, we're going to come off it, well, I think we look at inflammation. That's important. Yeah. We want to get this person as healthy as possible before they start taking off their antidepressant. So we can use things like fish oil and curcumin. We can use things like uh, probiotics. We can use methylation support like B group vitamins. The zinc, I'm not too sure about, but certainly magnesium. Yep. And we can use uh, a good old NAC. We talked about that in the last... Absolutely. In the last podcast. Um, GAB is a bit uh, unusual because most people think it doesn't go past the blood-brain barrier, so I never use it. I, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Exactly that. There are that. Some moral out there. I'm actually more interested in GABA's effect on immune-mediated gut dysfunction. Yeah. So yep. rather okay. than, you know, its mind action, I think it's going to for, find its place in the gut. Okay, as an oral product. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, as okay. you say, it doesn't yeah, cross the blood-brain barrier when you give it oral. No. There, there, there are some forms out there that I say uh, have some sort of effect uh, going through the blood-brain barrier. Well, you've got, I, that's I, the gabapentins and things like that, you know. Yeah, gabapentin, but unfortunately they don't work on the GABA receptor once they get in there. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting drug, that. Yes. But I don't think they've really come across a real GABA actual thing that works on the GABA receptor correctly. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we could use tryptophan. If we're talking about getting someone off the antidepressant, but first of all, as I said, let's let's try and get their inflammation down. Let's get them as healthy as possible. Let's get them motivated to do some exercise. I mean, these are all difficult things. Yeah. Get them on a Mediterranean diet. 
Um, the, around about 80% of people who start exercising who haven't been exercising and they're depressed will, will stop their depression. Yeah. So exercise is an incredible way as a person. Um, I find it hard to exercise. I've got a personal trainer who makes me come down, brings me up until you get down here. <laughs> so I know it's difficult. Um, so, yeah, getting someone to, to exercise is very difficult, but it, it's incredibly important for yeah. someone who is, is depressed. Um, but then we can do those things to stop the inflammation. We can do those things to help uh, methylation. Um, and then if we want to get them off their antidepressant, they do have a physical addiction. And uh, interestingly enough, in, in the uh, uh, literature, it's called a discontinuation syndrome. I never <laughs> call it withdrawal <laughs> because the, the pharmacological companies will refuse to call it a withdrawal, but they call it a discontinuation syndrome. And interestingly enough, the worst one that, that, that actually causes the most side effects is the venlafaxine, which is the SNRI. Yeah. Uh, even though it's the... One of the most effective as far as getting uh, with a depression, it's also one of the harder ones to get off. So what we need to do is gradually taper people off their antidepressants. That's important. And it may take about three months to do that, um, particularly after long therapy. Um, you know, people have been on these drugs for, for years, so sometimes it takes a minimum of three months to come off them. And even then, after a period of time, or even after that, they still get some some withdrawal effects. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and as I said, the SNRIs are probably the hardest ones to come off. As far as SFRIs and NS SNRIs are concerned, but generally tricyclics are actually even more difficult than the others. Greg, what do you find the usefulness of um, St John's Wort, um, given that there's, you know, there's that chance of interaction with the a antidepressant? Yeah. Well, I, I particularly like uh, St John's Wort. It's an interesting product because it works on a lot of neurotransmitters. It mm. doesn't just look at noradrenaline or it doesn't just look at serotonin. It seems to work on all of them in some way. So it seems to have a smaller effect on all the neurotransmitters and therefore it tends to have less side effects. Um, there has been a, there's been a bit of a discussion in the NPS, the National Prescribing, uh, saying that they've decided that St. John's Wort can potentially have the same effects as paroxetine, which is an SSRI. And I agree that's a certainly potential, but most of these things are theoretical. I, I haven't found that whenever I put someone on St. John's in a real problem. Uh, there's certainly been some problems, but not, not like the same as with uh, SSRIs in particular. The sexual dysfunction, the nausea and insomnia, I don't find that happens with St. John's wart, even though it's potentially possible. Now, now what... if you're going to take someone off an SSRI or any sort of any person and put them on St. John's wart, you need to have a bit of a washout period, even though I don't think there's ever been an, uh, a, an actual case of the serotonin syndrome with that combination. I'm glad you said that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I don't think there's any documented case. No, I it's have, all theoretical. No, I've looked on the DAEN, the Drug Adverse Event Notification, and I can't find an, a, an instance. But it yeah. is a theoretical it's, one. Yeah, yeah, it's theoretical. And you know, it's quite interesting. Now, there's a lot of psychiatrists now actually giving two so, anti so, uh, sorry antidepressants together. Yeah, and, and and not worrying about things, you know, and saying oh, I ring them up and say, hey, listen, did you realise that these guys are on two? I'm like, yeah, no problem, don't worry. And, you know, tramadol comes up all the time with an antidepressant and the doctors say, don't worry. Wow. But if you start saying, if you start saying St. John's Wort, they have a panic yeah. attack. Yeah. <laughs> so it's only because it's the unknown, I think, and they're not using it. But um, just to be safe, I would say a washout period of a few days at least once the person's completely off their um, other antidepressant and then go on to the St. John's Wort if they're interested in using that instead of nothing for their depression. Um, we can certainly use SAMI, as I said, but it's very expensive. Yeah. That's the problem with SAMI. And do you find that um, you need high doses or, or tell me what dose you yeah, take? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you need like 800 milligrams a day minimum. And, you know, you go through a b bottle of SAMI very quickly if you're using that sort of dosage. Mm, absolutely. Um, you can use Carver as well. Carver's an interesting one because it's anti-anxiety and it's also antidepressant over a long period of time mm. after you use it for a while. So I have used carb. I have used carb in some cases. There is that uh, problem that perhaps it may affect liver function. So we've got to keep an eye on that. And anyone with 
any problems with their liver, I don't give them kava, even though that's starting to become saying it's not really uh, a problem with the with the water soluble kava. No, that's right. I mean, even with, that was yeah, yeah, that was really an issue years ago when. A, you had abuse syndromes when they took over, I think it was 180 milligrams or 160 milligrams of the carbolactones per day, or yeah. B, when they were using these acetone extractions, um, which yeah. I, I don't think was seen in Australia. Indeed, the, the one, I can't remember if it was a death or a liver transplant that was required from a carver containing product turned out right. not to be the carver itself anyway. It turned out to be adulteration of uh, one of the other herbs in there. Yeah. So Yeah, yeah I think it's been it's been overreaction for sure. Mm. Uh, the other thing is I think they also thought that some species of carver were, were worse than others. As yes. As, uh, liver, liver yeah, Jerome too. Saris, he's, he's looked at this. So, yeah, I, I mean, I do use carver. I, I like it as far as uh, helping people sleep. I think it's a good sleeping product. Compared to say valerian, deliver, and I like I like valerian as a tranquilizer through the day. Yeah, I like carver as a, as a sedative at night or hypnotic. But um, going back to getting people off the uh, SSRIs or, or tra- uh, antidepressants in general, yes, I do give them a washout period before I su- suggest they start St John's Wort. Yeah, um, but- unfortunately, as we know with with herbal medicine, quality is paramount. And I just can't believe that you can buy St. John's Wood in the supermarket. I just think it's just incredible mm. <laughs> that that exists. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, people go and buy some bad quality of St. John's Wood and just say it's not uh, useless. So, yeah, yeah. Of course, tell their doctor that, and that's that's where some problems can certainly come up. One one of the interesting things I've seen is the evolution of what we think is an active um, in St. John's Wood, and and it. <laughs> Um, do you remember the days years ago when it used to be um, hypericin, then it was hypericins, then it was, oh, yeah. no, it's, it's hyperforin, and then it's, oh, no, it's yeah. hyper, hyperforins. And now, yeah, that's right. now we think, you know, with products like Remotive where it's actually low hyperforin, indeed some of the research yeah. shows that the high hyperforin products didn't work with, with, with depression. Um, so it's a low yeah. hyperforin product and it might be the flavonoids. <laughs> so yeah. Well, I think they're trying to get away from the drug interactions with the low light before. Yeah. Too, you know. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I, I mean, there's so many uh, ingredients in the plant that we don't really know exactly what is going on, but those markers seem to be reasonable as far as look, looking at the quality of the product. And, you know, some of these products that are on the shelf have got no markers or no way of knowing what their what uh, active ingredients are like. What about support, online support or support organisations um, that people suffering anxiety or depression can lean on? Like, for instance, you've got um, um, Black Dog Institute, you've got Beyond Blue, yeah. and you've got, um, ah, I've just gone blank on the, the ANU-based one, Mood Gym. You know Mood okay. Gym? I don't know that one, to be honest. Oh, no. okay. I know the other two, yeah. I haven't had a lot of experience with those products, with those with those uh, ideas, but um, I've had other people who say they work. I, I tend to use the local psychologists. I don't tend to use those. Yeah. But uh, whether those psychologists then move them on to them, I, I, I don't know the actual answer to that. So as far as that sort of support goes, I tend to use a psychologist. Yeah. But um, I don't have anything against it, and it certainly seems to be... Um, Efficacious because it's still there, isn't it? A lot of people seem to be using it. Yeah, I think I think the only issue would be, you know, particularly in uh, more severe depression, obviously a safety issue with suicidal ideation, things like that. But yeah, yeah, you'd yeah. want an intervention right now if they had suicidal ideation. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's interesting to know that some of the uh, antidepressants have suicidal ideation as a side effect as well. <laughs> so yeah. it's a very interesting situation there, but. Um, Another interesting statistic is since uh, we, we talked about the over, over-prescribing of antidepressants, but it seems that once antidepressants have become into the picture, the suicide rate has gone down. I read some some sort of uh, statistic about that one day not so long ago. I don't know how true it is, but mm. um, that was interesting. So perhaps for, for, for a very severe uh, depression, antidepressants work well. Yeah. But unfortunately, for this this very uh, not so severe uh, depression, they're probably 
going on the side effects of the drug, for instance, they're a stimulant, so they feel better, and that makes them think that the drug is good. Yeah. Do you only institute somebody getting off an antidepressant when they themselves wish that? Yes, as well as in interaction with their doctor. I would never do it if just, just they, they say to me, I want to get off this. I need to talk to their doctor as well, or their prescriber. Yeah. It may be a, it may be a psychiatrist. But um, like in my pharmacy, we have a psychiatrist next door who does a lot of good work. He's a young guy, and we have a great relationship with him. I've got his mobile number. I can ring him about patients any time of the day or night. And um, so if you've got to have a, you have a good relationship with your prescriber, you can discuss things and decide what you're going to do. Mm. Um, I certainly wouldn't like to just say to someone, okay, let's get you off this, but um, because it's just too dangerous. Absolutely. There may be reasons why they're on that drug you don't know about. Absolutely. It's, it's even more dangerous if you're talking about antipsychotics, of course. Yeah. And that just brings up an interesting thing about antipsychotics, that the quetiapine is an antipsychotic that's been getting around lately, and there's a lot of people starting to abuse that drug. They're calling it uh, baby heroin or Susie Q, they call it, and they're using it instead of heroin because it's easier to get. And they're actually injecting it. And so we're finding that uh, people are getting Seroquel, which is traditionally an antipsychotic, right. and using it instead of heroin when they can't get it. How are they getting a hold of it? Oh, look, GPs can prescribe it. Plus, it's on the street. Right. You know, there's, people get it on their prescriptions and then sell it. Right. It's quite common. Wow. Another common one they do that with, of course, is the dexamphetamine mm. or Ritalin and those types of amphetamine type products. There's a lot of people out there who get that prescribed for them and then sell them on the street. Yeah. So I was going to ask about other classes of drugs, including, you know, the Ritalins and um, NSAIDs, for instance. So mm. what mm. other patient groups do you see? What other drugs are the are the, the big issues in, in the Australian community to get off? Well, I certainly like to get people off NSAIDs. There's NSAIDs, there's no doubt about that. Um, I, I have a um, home medication review company where... We go out to the patient's house, look at their medicines, and then give a report back to the GP what we think they're taking and what they shouldn't be taking or, you know, get a second opinion on their drugs. Mm. And, of course, any time I see an NSAID, I suddenly see alarm bells and I don't want them to have it unless it's absolutely necessary because we know it increases the chance of cardiovascular problems. Yep. Uh, we know it gives them gut problems. And you can tell people this who are in pain, though, and they find it very hard still to get off it. Yeah. Quite often I tell them about, you know, okay, you're going to have a maybe a 50% chance more of having a heart attack if you take this drug every day. They still say, but i still got bad back pain or I've still got bad arthritis, something like that. So naturally we have to find something for that. Now, traditionally we've given them a, a maximum dose of paracetamol instead, try to get them off the end. So a lot of people take both, but if they're not taking in that maximum dose of, that, of paracetamol, we'd start with that. And interestingly enough, in the UK, they started to say, no, that's wrong too, because mm. they're starting to find liver problems and kidney problems with too much paracetamol. And wasn't there also a lack of effect with lower back pain? It was as good yes. as placebo, is that right? That is correct. That is correct. It's just come out now. Mm. But there's probably really no effect with, with back pain. And it was interesting. With the arthritis, so it may be worth a go. And a lot of people are taking incense for the arthritis. Yeah. But I read a blog recently from a UK doctor and he said, what have we got left? A piece of leather to put between their teeth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, but what, we, what they don't realise is, of course, we can use curcumin, we can use boswellia, we can use fish oil. We can use all these wonderful natural anti inflammatories and they work very, very well. There's been some good trials to say that the curcumoids and, and the boswellia are equal to some of the insights. Yeah. So naturally, I'm going to say straight away, I'm going to give you a natural anti-inflammatory that will work and, and let's give it a go. And a lot of people will try that then. If you just say, I'm going to give you some turmeric, and I, they, they say, I don't know what you're talking about. So it's important to say, okay, this is a natural anti-inflammatory similar to your NSAID that's going to help you with your inflammation and pain. And I find that if I give them the turmeric or the boswellia, one or the other. I, I, I tended to use a lot of Boswellia in the old, older days, but yeah. now I'm starting to use more of the turmeric now that it's much better absorbed yeah. with the new new ways of absorption, the micronization and uh, those other ways of doing things. But, um, so I'm using a bit more turmeric now and maybe 
continuing on with their paracetamol, but basically getting off their inside is, yeah. is the bottom line. I like um, uh, the the thing that I like is the blending of of natural supplements and ma- to make pharmaceutical medications either safer or not so or, or sorry um, abrogating their side effect profile like for instance fish oil um, has an NSAID sparing effect so you're not using so many you're still on it but you're yes. not using you're not yes. needing so many to get a pain relieving effect and that has a good effect on your That's gut right. and your pain yeah exactly and it's actually helping them and, and this is the way I explain it to people too we're giving you something that's going to help your health. We're going to give you turmeric. We're going to give you boswellia. We're going to give you fish oil. Those things are going to actually increase your health. Mm. They're going to make you healthier mm. compared to an NSAID, which is going to make you unhealthy. Mm-hmm. So if you can explain it that way, it tends to make them give it a go. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, rheumatoid arthritis is a classic example of where fish oil has been well proven to reduce people's NSAIDs. That, that was not um, so much with uh, not so much with uh, RA, but RA definitely. Yeah, yeah that was um, Professor Les Cleland from uh, Royal Adelaide mm. Hospital, I think. Yeah, in the early two thousands. Yeah, 2000s, yeah. So, yeah, and and we're starting to see that coming through with Boswellia and Tumeric as well. So mm. People reducing their insides with with rheumatoid arthritis. One of the other things that I like about the use of fish oil and curcumin is is um, that if you have that safe anti-inflammatory effect, not only is it going to make them "Quote unquote healthier," but um, it's also going to allow them to initiate an exercise regime, and that in itself is going to help their disease or you know reduce their disease Absolutely. progression. Yeah. Absolutely. A lot of people, with, for instance, with arthritis, think that the exercise is going to make them worse, mm. and we know from clinical trials it actually makes them better That's right. as long as they exercise, exercise correctly. Mm. And um, we're also finding out that arthritis is more a systemic inflammation problem, not just a wear and tear of the joint. So osteoarthritis, we always used to say, oh, it's because you've got too much weight in your joint or you've been using it over and over again, and it's wearing out. And now, of course, we're realising that, that, that this is more of a systemic problem. And so we've got a systemic inflammation that may be causing this, 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 this arthritis. And so if we can get them onto an uh, curcumin or fish oil, Instead of the inside, we might be able to actually reduce the uh, ongoing effects of the of the disease or reduce the progression. Of course, we use glucose aminochondroitin as well. Yep. Um, Do you find krill oil active in in pain, reducing pain? I haven't used it much in pain. Um, I've been told by someone and trying to convince me that it's much better for dyslipidemia. Um, I haven't had enough evidence to tell me that. A lower dose of EPA DHA is going to be absorbed so much better to work. Um, but um, to me, it's uh, different though. Like fish it. oil, fish oil doesn't work on on lipidemia apart from reducing triglycerides. Not at all, either. That's right. So no, that's exactly <laughs> right. It doesn't work at all on this lipidemia, except for triglycerides, which I do use. I I do want to bring down people's triglycerides. Yeah. It's necessary, of course. It's very important. But. Um, a particular vitamin company is trying to tell me that, yes, their, their krill oil is showing them that their dyslipidemia will it'll reduce cholesterol, it'll reduce uh, LDL and increase HDL. Yeah. Um, via the acesanthin combination with the EPO DHA, um, but I haven't had enough uh, information given me independently to really say that's true. No, so I, I don't use it particularly. Yeah, it was all company-sponsored, and I think it's very early days to talk about krill oil with dyslipidemia. It seems yep. to ha- have found its place in small joint arthritis, you know, fingers, toes. Mm, mm. Um, but I've never seen great effects in a weight-bearing joint yet. No, I- I'm sort of just saying what I say to people is I'm open-minded about it at this stage, but I'm still using fish oil. Mm. There's a there's a, an interesting Cochrane uh, review on... Um, the evidence of herbs for lower back pain. I think there was um, devil's claw, wh- uh, white willow, willow bark, um, capsaicin, and something else, and I can't remember. Yeah. Well, I do use a bit of willow bark. I find devil's claw a little bit difficult because it's hard to get the active ingredient up to, to enough level. Uh, the habacoside, I think it is, isn't it? That mm. needs to be, I think, about 50 milligrams daily or 60, something like that. 50, 60, yeah. It's a, it's a bit hard to get, you know, I think you have to take quite a bit of it to get to that. So I tend to use more boswellia and curcumin than, than those mm-hmm. in, in my practice anyway. So, Greg, do you treat 
children at all? Like, for instance, those kids that might be on uh, um, Ritalin? No, I don't. No, um, I prefer to leave that in, in the hands of the doctors if they've already commenced Ritalin. So um, it's 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 a very controversial area, I know. Mm. Um, but if someone wants to come to me that are not on Ritalin and have a, have a child who wants to be treated, yes, I will treat them. So before they get onto the drug? Yes, that's correct. Right. Um, I guess I've never had the experience of someone coming to me and say, I want to get my child off Ritalin and will you help me? I, I just haven't come across that as this, at this stage. Yeah. Um, but it certainly would have to be something that the doctor would tell me to do mm. rather than the patient. Cool. And what about any other caveats and cautions that we need to be aware of when we're, you know, helping patients to get off drugs. Obviously, there's that, you know, ongoing communication with their prescriber, their doctor, or their psych- that's psychiatrist. That's that's param- that's paramount. Um, what I find is, as I said in the beginning, that most doctors will, will want you to get people off benzos. Yeah. So that's pretty. That's pretty almost a given. Although some say no. Um, you definitely have to have permission from the prescriber to get someone off an anti anti uh, person, I think, or an antipsychotic. Yep. Well, not permission, but you know, just talk about it, and if it works, it works. Yeah. Um, a very important thing about benzos, though, is if someone's on a very high dose of benzos, they can actually be very, very difficult to withdraw. You can't just jump in and say, I'm going to get people off benzos if they're on a high dose because they can actually have an epileptic fit and die yeah. from a benzo uh, withdrawal. Detoxification or withdrawal. Mm. It's very different from, say, someone with heroin, for instance. You know, We know they're not going to die. But a benzo can actually cause an epileptic fit when you withdraw if they're on a high dose, a very high dose, over a long period of time. So you have to be careful there. What about caveats and cautions with supplements? Well, the big one, of course, is St. John's Wort when you're going to mix it with some other drugs. That, and we need to, A, worry about serotonin syndrome and, B, worry about uh, drug interactions. I think that's the main drug that we have problems with, um, I guess. And we've talked about that the serotonin syndrome has so far only been theoretical, but we still need to keep it in mind. And I think the other thing is we've got to worry about um, perhaps if we're going to take someone off a drug and get them on a herb like carver, we don't want them to just go straight into some sort of abuse system yeah. with with the other herb, with, with the herb there. Yeah. And I think carver is really the only one I can think of that that would happen with, to be honest. So, Greg, thanks for taking us through. I mean, that's it's such an in-depth podcast, and, and that's been one of the longer ones we've had, but I tell you, that's critical for practitioners to know about because there's so mm. many areas of responsibility and, and indeed so many areas, um, so many classifications of drugs that are needed to be addressed that I think it required a, an in-depth look at that. So thank you for taking us through that. Okay. Now, I do just want to wrap up by um, introducing, if you like, uh, that you've got a, a very long um, uh involvement in a short course in integrative medicine that's directed for pharmacists if they have an interesting um, an interest in ongoing education in this vein. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, it started back at uh, when I was just, uh, lecturing at Griffith University, and a colleague of mine, Evelyn Tiralongo, and myself, we decided that uh, pharmacists aren't getting enough education at the university in integrative medicine. So we wrote a short course in integrative medicine, which is basically around 10 lectures um, in different areas like cardiovascular pain, women's health, et cetera, et cetera. And we did a uh, two-day weekend course for pharmacists around Australia in all the capital cities. We went to New Zealand as well. Mm. It was quite popular. And um, it was a face-to-face two-day course, which they then got a certificate of completion from Griffith University. Um, Blackmore's contacted the university and said they were interested in taking that course over. So eventually they bought it off the university and have now got it online for free. So you can go and do a short course in integrative medicine via the Blackmore's Institute. The Blackmore's Institute, of course, is separate from the Blackmore's company in that it's just purely research. Mm. And everything we talk about in our course is generic. There's no... Uh, labels or anything. Talk. We don't talk about Blackmores at all, or any other company for that matter. Yep. So it's purely generic, and, and it's a it's a ten module course, open to anyone. So we find a lot of actually other health practitioners are using it as well, like doctors, nurses, naturopaths. Anyone can do that course. You don't have to be a pharmacist. Mm-hmm. We, we 
first started out as pharmacists, scar course, but now anyone can do it, and we're finding quite a lot of other health professionals are doing it. Right. And once you finish that 10 modules online, which is free, as I said, you can go on to do a uh, masterclass that we, uh, Evelyn and I do. Uh, you know, we probably do five or six a year around the country, which is a face-to-face one-day masterclass, mainly doing uh, case histories, yep. case studies. And that's for pharmacists only, is that right? Uh, at this stage, yes. We're, we haven't really decided what we're going to do about that yet. I think we will change it because the problem that we had was we, uh, we've, we've got uh, uh, points for pharmacists, you know, and we haven't got them for doctors yet. So yeah. Um, once we get that organised, perhaps we'll, we'll we'll open up to doctors and nurses. Yeah. So to do the free course, they go to the Blackmores Institute, and then That's if right. that once they've completed that, they contact Griffith University School of Pharmacy. Is that right? Um, there's a, there's a way of contacting that's at the end of the course that, that tells you how how you can do the masterclass. So uh, it's all written in that course how to how you contact us for. It, it, we've got our own website. You gotcha. go through to register. Do you yep. teach any of this drug detox to pharmacists in that course? No. No. So this no, is a not separate much. Thing. They, they need to listen to this podcast. That's right, they should. <laughs> it could be another module. <laughs> we, we, uh, we really, we're really open for other modules. We certainly have other modules in mind. And um, we at the end of the course, we ask people what they want to know about. And, and certainly these things come up and we'll be writing extra modules eventually. Oh, fantastic. So I definitely see further growth on the horizon. That's wonderful. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, it's been going quite well so far. Greg, thank you so much once again for taking us through what is a very complex and very convoluted um, podcast, you know, to do with treating or helping to support patients trying to get off drugs, pharmaceutical drugs Mm. in this instance. And I Mm. really thank you for that. And I've got to say, I really applaud your responsibility in working, you know, with the prescribers, working hand in hand as an integral part of the, the health professional team. Um, you know, not yep. a sort of a cowboy thing. You really have the patient's health at heart, and I, I really thank you for that. No problem, Andrew. Thank you. This is FX Medicine, and I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. This podcast was brought to you by the New Science of Detoxification Advanced Approaches to Phase 1, 2, and 3 Support. For more information, visit bioceuticals.com.au slash education slash events.